hide the dead, I think. Today, he is going to give a, an, an, an extensive lecture on capital repair of sinus venosus ASD. We look for learning, we may change our ways of attending meetings uh, and so on. So um, hopefully this thing will become a positive uh, aspect of the future. Um, those are <clears throat> my disclosures uh, in general. And right at the beginning, I want to thank um, these colleagues from our hospital, Eric, <clears throat> Eric Rosenthal in particular, an interventional colleague who has been the push um, behind uh, the development of this, and then various other colleagues who uh, have an interest in um, MRI and CT scanning, uh, transesophageal echocardiogram, uh, 3D printing, all of them who've been involved in helping to develop this. Um, I've taken a couple of these pictures uh, from uh, a paper and books, uh, really just to highlight the fact that sinus venosus uh, defects, <clears throat> they're not strictly atrial septal defects because they're uh, not in the atrial septum. Um, there is a sort of unroofing uh, between the superior vena cava at the front and the pulmonary vein behind um, that causes the defect. And traditionally, the defects have been considered uh, surgical as opposed to the secundum defects that we've been closing for uh, uh, many, many years now. And the surgeons <clears throat> uh, carry out uh, patching of the secundum ASD, or, uh, sinus venosus ASD with redirection uh, of the pulmonary vein. So surgery has been considered the mainstay of treatment of this. Because of the various techniques, there's a variety of techniques involved in doing uh, surgery, there is a small incidence of uh, complications such as SVC stenosis or even complete occlusion at times, pulmonary vein stenosis uh, postoperatively and some even lower incidence of sinus node dysfunction. Um, then, <clears throat> what about catheter intervention? And I want to give a, a special mention to Hussein Abdullah from uh, Iraq, uh, who really first reported a catheter attempt um, in, uh, at CSI uh, seven years ago now, in 2013, uh, where between 2011 and 2013, it attempted four patients um, with sinus venosus defects uh, with catheter closure. And the age range of these patients was seven to 23 years. There were two patients who had the original eight zig covered CP stents, the, um, the eight zig ones. And one patient had a covered CP stent combined with an Oxitec ASD device because there was still a large um, shunt uh, underneath the stent edges. And then uh, one patient who had two covered CP stents, and this is one, I'll go back. This is an example, if you can see my cursor, uh, of one such patient with a residual shunt. Uh, there's a catheter through the shunt into the left pulmonary vein, and then uh, an Amplatzer PF4 device was delivered here, and the other, the right atrial disc, was um, anchored within the covered CP stent in order to uh, close that defect. So uh, complex, uh, but innovative. And uh, really, uh, Hussein uh, deserves a lot of credit for this. Uh, I mean, it took him a lot longer to publish this. This was only published last year uh, with some fo late follow-up. And then uh, subsequently, uh, uh, Gaurav Garg, uh, a year after Hussein reported this, uh, reported um, a 35-year-old patient with a sinus venosus defect in whom uh, he and Anil um, uh, sh implanted a Advanta V12 covered stent um, at 12 millimeter diameter by 61 millimeter uh, length. This was a 35-year-old lady um, who had bilateral SVCs, <clears throat> a small right superior vena cava uh, with um, sinus spinosis defect and anomalous pulmonary vein and um, uh, this works uh, quite well and they reported that. Another one was um, uh, at uh, Frankfurt, Jennifer Franker reported a 65 year old patient 
with uh, Terry Sidras's immediate release patch closure, and that seemed to work um, as well. And then, of course, Shiva, our host um, moderator here, has got large experience of these, and he will talk about um, this as well. Um, in our own unit, um, we published uh, uh, quite a, uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, uh, just the imaging side and 3D printed models uh, and the value of, and I'll briefly touch on those. Um, so, um, catheter repair, having seen the reports uh, from uh, Hussein Abdullah and Garg, uh, we at that time we were also trying to work out how best to deal with this. And there's some diagrammatic representation here from one of the papers from India, uh, where the covered stent um, uh, is positioned here. And the potential is uh, that uh, the upper uh, anomalous right upper pulmonary vein or veins could potentially be obstructed depending on where they're draining into the superior vena cava. So there is a variation in the uh, location of right upper pulmonary veins. That's, uh, uh, variation in size of those right upper pulmonary veins. There's a variation in the size of the right atrium, which will determine how much flaring uh, to perform on the bottom end of the stent. There's a variation in the size of the sinus stenosis defect. There are occasional bilateral SVCs, which then result in a smaller right SVC. And then very occasionally, there is a PFO present that may have to be dealt with. Um, so what you hope is um, this sort of a result where the covered stent does not obstruct the right uh, upper anomalously draining pulmonary vein uh, rather than this appearance. Um, the, uh, you have to work out what length of covered stent to use, what diameter it should be dilated to in the superior vena cava and what diameter it should be flared at the bottom and whether you need an overlapping bare stent or covered stent uh, or not. If you're using a bare stent, usually it would be at the upper end of the SV, uh, towards the SVC, and if there was another overlapping covered stent needed, it, it tends to be in the bottom end, where uh, the bottom end of the first stent may have missed the atrial septum edges. Um, there is a uh, 3D model uh, a representation of uh, one, one of our fellows who um, has uh, developed this uh, and here you can see uh, what he's doing he's put a this is a sinus venosus defect 3d representation put a stent inside and then we're trying to assess whether the right pulmonary vein there if you can see the cursor remains uncompressed and whether it's likely to continue to drain into the left atrium or whether it's likely to become compressed by the stent. So uh, this has um, uh, now really replaced our 3D printing. So there are several steps um, that are involved in this. First one is the CT or MRI evaluation for suitability. Next is the access and approach. We use transesophageal echo assessment. We use venous access, uh, both for a uh, getting a guide wire circuit, femoral vein access, and for the pulmonary vein access, and I'll come back to that. Balloon interrogation is done using, uh, initially we were using compliant balloons like the ASD sizing balloons, but now um, uh, we use a combination of those and non-compliant balloons. And then the issues are selection of size of the stents, and then uh, the very well mentioned some tips during implantation and the final flaring. Um, so echocardiography, well, transthoracic echocardiogram uh, depends on age, really, but in adults, it's very difficult to make a clear diagnosis of sinus venosus defect. In children, we can. Um, and here you see um, a superior sinus venosus defect, but transesophageal echo uh, really is the uh, uh, next main method of uh, assessing this. And you can see uh, there's the sinus venosus defect, and although it's difficult um, to be sure uh, uh, because of imaging problems, uh, whether there's anomalous pulmonary veins draining, multiple of them draining, or one draining into the SVC right atrial junction. And so, although transesophageal echo helps in making that diagnosis, uh, we then have to, uh, now that we're doing cathode, uh, 
catheter repair, uh, we're now doing MRIs or CTs, uh, CT scans to uh, confirm the diagnosis. Here's a, uh, some still pictures of um, uh, CT scan of a sinus venosus defect. You can see here the uh, sinus venosus defect. There's the superior vena cava right atrium, left atrium overriding superior vena cava. And then here is the uh, right upper pulmonary vein draining anomalously into the SVC RA junction uh, with a potential for going into the left atrium. And there <clears throat> are middle and lower pulmonary veins draining directly uh, into the um, left atrium. From those, uh, we initially um, uh, did 3D prints and then we played around with the 3D prints really to see whether how realistic it was for us to implant a uh, stent in the SVT uh, without uh, blocking the right pulmonary vein. So here you see a sheet pass through the right upper pulmonary vein. There you see a, a, a potential stent uh, in the SVC there. And then we're trying to evaluate whether the right upper pulmonary vein continues to drain into the left atrium. This is a view from the back. Uh, and you see the uh, sheath going from that anomalous right pulmonary vein into the left atrium uh, with a stent in position uh, inside that model. Uh, and that then reassured us and that this is a, a cut in the left atrium from behind showing uh, that with the stent in place, the um, uh, sheath goes uh, towards the left atrium and therefore the stent is not uh, compressed or blocked. So, we then we played around with the 3D models and then we decided we would uh, check on them uh, under fluoroscopy as well. So here's, um, uh, you can see the model with uh, stents in the superior vena cava uh, long enough to cover the sinus venosus defect. And then there's a dilator in red and then we check that on fluoroscopy as well with a <clears throat> catheter or wire position, uh, a catheter position in the left pulmonary vein from that right pulmonary vein. And then once we've done the simulation and shown that the pulmonary veins are okay and the defect can be closed, uh, we uh, then plan uh, on balloon interrogation of the defect with um, TOE and angiography and uh, work out the size of the 10 zig covered CP stents and the appropriate diameter balloons. We went for 10 zig largely because in adults, the SVC tends to be uh, quite big size, um, 22, 24, 26, 28 millimeter region. And the eight zig covered CP stent <clears throat> really uh, shortens a lot and the covering tears. And so uh, 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 we thought we would use the 10 zig instead. Um, just to re-emphasize this, um, uh, concept that we were playing around with with 3D prints. You can see in this example, uh, stent in place, still picture, and there's the dilator clearly going from that anomalous pulmonary vein <clears throat> into the left atrium, uh, sh showing us the feasibility uh, of this procedure. And then uh, we thought, well, there may be some patients in whom uh, we could potentially compress the pulmonary vein, and here uh, we've got a uh, an atlas balloon uh, going from the right upper pulmonary vein into the left atrium, uh, uh, inflated and indenting uh, the um, stent. And we were trying to see whether that could protect uh, the right upper pulmonary vein uh, when it looks as if it could be compressed. So that was again a model that we uh, played around with in order to um, uh, do this. So here's a a 3D representation uh, simulation of that procedure. So the, the, it looks on the assessment as if the, when the stent was fully inflated, it would compress the pulmonary vein. And so uh, here's a, uh, an active balloon in place in order to protect. And that uh, showed us that potentially uh, that could work as well. There you see the picture. So the procedure itself, we uh, then, uh, uh, initially, when we started off, we uh, went for um, uh, accessing the pulmonary vein <clears throat> from a retrograde arterial approach for, with a catheter wire in the uh, aorta left ventricle, cross the mitral valve, 
spent a lot of time, a long time, trying to get into the anomalous pulmonary vein, and that caused um, us to have a longer procedure. And there you see the uh, uh, catheter wire going into the left atrium, and then we lay around trying to get uh, into the pulmonary vein. Um, <clears throat> all of it was done under the transesophageal echo assessment. Uh, then we <clears throat> did a guide wire uh, uh, from, from femoral vein to right internal jugular vein. So access is required in the right internal jugular vein as well for that circuit. Uh, the catheter that we used for the initial crossing into the pulmonary vein was a cut pigtail or occasionally multi-purpose combined with a truma wire. But more recently, <coughs> uh, we've uh, become quicker and more confident with then using uh, a transeptal puncture, um, getting into the uh, sheath into the left atrium, and then rotating that sheath, uh, and I'll come back to that. Um, this is um, the example of um, uh, showing the feasibility of uh, balloon interrogation, doing the measurements of the balloon. In this example, uh, 25 millimeters, 28 millimeters, lower down, 22 millimeters at the narrowest, uh, and then uh, uh, a 3D rotational angiogram of SVC with a balloon inflated showing and pulmonary vein angiogram uh, showing unobstructed pulmonary veins. Um, that's slightly out of sequence, I'm afraid. Um, uh, then we, once we've done the transeptal, we, uh, it's a bit easier and quicker to um, get a catheter into the anomalous right upper pulmonary vein, and we then do various angiograms. In this, <clears throat> these pictures, it's superior vena cava angiogram, um, just to uh, identify some landmarks. And then over the guide wire circuit, an ASD sizing balloons inflated, and we do SVC angios. And the point I was making about this bulging uh, of the ASD sizing balloon there into where the anomalous uh, pulmonary vein is, uh, that's an important area that we have to focus on uh, because that can, that can potentially uh, uh, lead to compression of the pulmonary vein. Uh, we some, do 3D rotational angiogram really in this example to show that the pulmonary vein is um, freely draining into the left atrium and redirected. Uh, here's a, a picture of a bulging of that um, uh, ASD sizing balloon <clears throat> and a little bit of hold up um, of the uh, contrast uh, on, in draining to the left atrium. And so, um, although initially we uh, excluded such patients where it looked as if there would be compression. Uh, now, <clears throat> with a slight modification using uh, the uh, uh, either an atlas balloon uh, uh, in the from the transeptal puncture into the right upper pulmonary vein at the time of inflation of the SVC stents, um, we can uh, we've shown that we can uh, do the procedure. Um, then, um, uh, once we've um, decided to proceed, we use uh, either usually 18 uh, French check flow performer sheet um, uh, from Cook or the 20 French dry seal sheet from Gore. Uh, you have to have big balloons of appropriate diameter and length for the stent that we've chosen. Usually, the balloon is about two to four millimeters larger than the SVC balloon interrogation diameter. Uh, and then the Tenzig co custom-made covered CP stent from Numed uh, mostly are six to eight centimeters long, although more recently we uh, veered towards just using the seven and eight centimeter length in order to reduce the possibility of overlapping stents. The upper end of the stent needs to be about two centimeters at least um, into the SVC, and usually that means um, either at or just below the level of the azicus vein. Uh, and the bottom end of the stent needs to be about two centimeters below the SVCRA junction uh, or uh, just below the uh, atrial septum uh, when, uh, when you see uh, on Francis of the echo. Um, so with those, if you've got four centimeters at least, um, and that then equates to another two to four centimeters uh, to cover the defect. So it works out at about seven or eight centimeter long stent. And then <clears throat> once we've selected the appropriate stent, 
Uh, you see here the stent is, uh, this is a Tenzig uh, covered CP stent uh, positions. Check angiograms being performed from the SVC. Uh, and then uh, when the stent is in correct position, uh, we then inflate the inner balloon and you can see that being inflated. And there's the outer balloon is inflated. Uh, and the, uh, during that, it's very important for the person holding the wire at the internal jugular uh, to, if I just go back, uh, at the time of inflating this outer balloon, uh, the wire has to be kept in the internal jugular to stop the stent balloon assembly milking down. During that, the procedure itself, transesophageal echo is absolutely vital uh, because you can see here uh, on the right there, uh, you want the stent <clears throat> really to be in contact with the atrial septum. This one, we just managed to catch it, although ideally it should be a little longer than that up to that firm part of the septum. Uh, and then uh, uh, transverse views to confirm <clears throat> that the pulmonary venous drainage uh, remains normal as well. So TOE is absolutely essential. Um, uh, flaring of the bottom end is um, the next part. We use a coda balloon um, to flare. Uh, and again, that has to be done carefully with monitoring of the transesophageal echocardiogram uh, um, because what tends to happen is the stent will shorten from bottom upwards, plus very occasionally the covering may slip upwards as well. Uh, and if that happens, and it has happened uh, once or twice with us, we then had to put a second covered stent at the bottom end uh, because it, the covering is retracted too much. And you can see in this example, the flaring has been probably overdone so that there's only a short amount of um, covered stent in the SVC. So here now is a second covered CP stent being brought up uh, to implant a higher up. Um, then um, once we've got a reasonable cover, sorry, um, uh, if there is a short segment of the covered stent in SVC, then we use a bare uh, CP stent to overlap at the top and that then anchors uh, the first custom-made Tenzig stent in position. So uh, this is an example where the uh, stent migrated uh, into the right atrium, you can see, and we use the sheath in order to push the stent up back in position. Uh, and then whilst the sheath was holding that stent in position, a second overlapping stent was then implanted from above. Uh, and once the anchoring has been done and the uh, stent secured, uh, then uh, the bottom end can be flared uh, as much as you want. Uh, to close the defect, and there's the uh, angiogram afterwards. And really, uh, the shape is unpredictable in terms of uh, how you want the covered stent to be shaped at the end, and you just have to uh, uh, keep flaring depending on transverse of your effort. And I've made the point about retraction of the covering, uh, and so you have to be careful about that. Afterwards, we maintain patients on aspirin for six months, the pitagrel for two months. To get, uh, at the same time. CT is performed at three months and MRI at one year and then 24 hour ambulatory AC, ECG at six to 12 months. So uh, just to uh, finish off with our experience, starting back in March 2016 uh, up to now, uh, we've uh, had 48 patients uh, that were considered. Of these, 29 patients have now had the procedure uh, performed. And there are eight still uh, eight patients out of this bunch considered unsuitable, uh, and the others are waiting uh, for us to proceed with the you know everything's on hold with the COVID virus. The age range varied between 24 and 66 years, median of 46. Weight range 64 to 83 kilograms. Uh, interestingly, there were bilateral SVCs in uh, eight patients. QPQR uh, QS varied between 1.4 to 4.5 to 1. Uh, in 10 patients, we used the retrograde arterial approach, and following that, uh, we've used the transeptal approach in the remainder, and there were two patients in whom there was a PFO present, so we used that. Uh, I mentioned the custom-made covered CP stent. 
uh, which are between 50 and 80 millimeters in length. So we've used the five centimeter one in one, six centimeter one in 14, seven centimeters in eight, and eight centimeters in six patients. The last few, quite a few have had either seven or eight. Um, the right upper pulmonary vein was protected with an atlas balloon in four patients because of that possibility of um, uh, compression. Balloon diameters have ranged between 18 and 30 millimeters. Uh, a second bare stent as an anchoring stent was needed in nine patients at the top end, and a second covered CT stent at the bottom end in four patients. <clears throat> there was one patient who had an additional PFO or ASD, it was a small ASD, those with an Oculitec device, and that was a patient who is a diver, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, who had to have that done in order to be allowed to dive. Procedures, uh, this is overall, uh, now the procedure is much quicker because of the transceptal and the fluoroscopy time given there. Um, this is one of our earliest patients in whom uh, we um, didn't uh, proceed because the, there was a sizable right upper pulmonary vein. There was another one here which drained into the left atrium, but the upper one was completely blocked. And so our surgeons felt that they could redirect that, and therefore we uh, sent the patient for surgery. But if there was um, uh, now, if a surgeon said that they would, this vein was too small and they would leave it, then we would carry on with the procedure. Uh, I emphasized about protection of the uh, right upper pulmonary vein um, uh, because of that compression. And here you see um, a, a right upper pulmonary vein angiogram. And with a, this is a non-compliant balloon. Uh, inflated where there was still a, a possible, there was a, still a compression here with a gradient between the pulmonary vein and the left atrium measured through the sheet. And so we were concerned about when we implanted a stent that we would compress this. And so we put an atlas balloon, I think this was a 16 millimeter uh, in position. Uh, we tested that with the uh, other balloon and then we kept the atlas balloon inflated whilst deploying the stent, uh, including an overlapping one. And now you can see with an overlapping stent that the pulmonary vein drains freely into the left atrium. So that's uh, another important uh, technical um, development um, um, to protect the pulmonary vein. The results, uh, there was a residual shunt in 11 patients by angiography at the end of the procedure. Uh, and in 15, with color Doppler echocardiography at the end. By the next day, there were six patients only who had a residual shunt on uh, color Doppler. Uh, there were a few complications. There were serious in two patients. One patient developed hemopericardium, which required surgical drainage. And that was, in the end, thought to be due to a transeptal puncture, uh, causing a little tear which healed. And then one stent, uh, I'll show the picture of that, embolized six hours after the procedure. Other less serious complications included a femoral artery aneurysm, uh, pseudo aneurysm requiring a thrombin injection. Uh, that was very difficult, retrograde arterial access. Uh, in the, uh, and then one patient who had neuropraxia, which resolved, one had developed atrial fibrillation during the procedure which needed DC cardioversion. This is a patient in whom the stent was flared uh, a reasonable amount, but at the end you see here Although it was flared, we got a good result. There was really not enough stent anchored in the SVC. And so six hours later, um, the stent migrated to the right ventricular outflow tract and had surgery. And so in retrospect, we should have really put an anchoring stent at that time. On follow-up, um, uh, CT scans in 22 patients, uh, that follow-up is between three months and four years. And you see here, <clears throat> the CT scans show patency of the um, pulmonary veins um, uh, uh, with a very good result. MRI scans have shown remodeling of the right ventricle. You see end diastolic volume uh, returning towards normal. Uh, there was no significant residual shunts in all except one patient who had a um, massive shunt to start with, about four to one. It still has a two to one residual shunt, and that's because there is a, a significant anomalous right upper pulmonary vein um, high up. No late complications have occurred. Sinus rhythm has been maintained on halter monitoring and no uh, uh, sinus node dysfunction. 
uh, chest x-ray example of a stent in place, CT scan follow-up showing good um, SVC patency and pulmonary veins draining into uh, um, left atrium. Uh, there you see a very good example of a write-up of pulmonary vein draining into the uh, left atrium, 3D reconstruction. And so to finish off, uh, now of course, capital closure of uh, appropriate, correctly selected patients is possible by, uh, in sinus stenosis defect. Uh, probably 75% of patients are suitable. Uh, it avoids surgery-related morbidity, mortality, risks of surgical stenosis. Uh, scent migration is a concern, but I think we've uh, improved on the technique. Things that we've learned are transeptal uh, puncture has um, replaced um, arterial approach to the right upper pulmonary vein, so the procedure is faster. We can measure pressure simultaneously between the pulmonary vein and left atrium. Uh, there's a stable access to pass a balloon into the pulmonary vein if that's needed. Uh, Non-compliant balloons are replacing the compliant balloons because of that bulging uh, into the pulmonary vein. Uh, anchoring of the stent uh, at the top end with a bare stent. Uh, uh, we've learned to do that quite a bit. Um, if there's an accessory pulmonary vein of, uh, high up, uh, that is left draining into the SVC, uh, if the surgeons would also leave it. Uh, and then longer stents, seven to eight centimeters, uh, are used because uh, we have a better length um, to oppose to the SVC. And then we can do a lot more flaring at the bottom end without too much shortening. Uh, instead of printing 3D models, we now do uh, uh, virtual model simulation with um, uh, computers. Uh, and that has also replaced our 3D prints. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaq. That was, a, that was an extremely exhaustive presentation covering all the aspects of uh, sinus stenosis. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was quite exhaustive. There are a lot of uh, questions that have come on the chat box. Some of the questions, what I will do is I will, I will give the Indian perspective. And yep. then we will, uh, I, will, I will ask you all the questions which I have noted down from the chat box. Uh, so that it, some of the, in fact, as the questions was running, uh, towards uh, mid part of your lecture, you were in fact answering some of those questions already. So Satya, can you uh, open my uh, screen and... Yeah, yeah, one second, sir. The moment uh, uh, I complete this the, uh, sort of a linked talk, then we will uh, take all the questions. Yeah, no problem. So you can share the screen. Yeah, the, uh, actually I, am, uh, I, I would say that uh, a large part of our experience was gained by very frequent discussions with Dr. Shaq Qureshi and Eric Rosenthal during various meetings. And uh, as pointed out by uh, Dr. Shaq, uh, Dr. Hussain Abdul Wahab from Baghdad, Iraq, when he presented it in CSI 2013, in one of the oral abstract presentation that a sinus venosus ASD can be closed with a covered stent. In fact, it was sort of sending uh, chills and shivers in the spines of many of the participants who are sitting there. But Shaq made it a reality. Uh, I, will, I will show how we got interested. This was the first patient who was 37 years with That's civil... Uh, I can't see the That's slides. You, I don't, I can... you have not shared the presentations. Is it mm. so? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, we can only see you. On the Zoom. Which is, which is fine. Screen. Which is fine <laughs> seeing you, but I think it would be better with your slides. Is it yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. I, I, was, I was mentioning, Shaq, that uh, Dr. Wahab, when he presented uh, in CSI 2013, it was really a sort of a chilling experience for many of the attendees who were watching that procedure and subsequently, one year later, Dr. Anil uh, from Hyderabad presented his experience, which was published. Uh, our interest was first in this patient who was having very significant pulmonary hypertension and we were doing uh, like a vasoreactive test. And we just, in this particular patient, we wanted to do a test balloon occlusion based on Wahab's principle. So this was just a trial run that was being done. Retrograde into the pulmonary vein and occluded it. 
we can appreciate that there was a complete occlusion of the pulmonary vein. And what was more interesting for us was uh, we put in a parallel venous catheter and entered into the pulmonary artery to record simultaneous pulmonary artery pressures continuously during this balloon occlusion. We found that the pulmonary artery pressures had a significant drop when we occluded the shunt across the sinus versus AST. And then when we deflated the balloon, it slowly the PA pressures again picked up without any major significant change in the systemic arterial pressures. And this convinced that this philosophy of balloon occlusion of the SVCRA junction to reroute that pulmonary vein and occluding the sinus venosus ASD was quite scientific and sound in its principles. In the same patient, when we were doing the transesophageal echocardiography, we can appreciate the catheter going into the superior vena cava here. There was a large amount of shunt, which is completely getting cut off with the balloon occlusion here. There is no residual flow at all. And with retained normal flows in the right upper pulmonary vein, with another catheter that is going across into the right upper pulmonary vein, continuously monitoring the pressures there as well. When we dopplered, we identified that the, the flows were consistently laminar, not much of pulmonary vein obstruction, and this patient gets a yeah, yeah, stent occlusion. Since there is a lack of availability of large number of long covered stents, this is two Andra XXL covered stents being placed simultaneously and is being sequentially expanded using a big balloon. This is the inner balloon. And then subsequently, the outer balloon is getting inflated. Exactly the same way in which how you are, you are showing the, the entire procedure. Which after post-procedure, you can see the laminar flows from the superior vena cava into the left atrium and normal pulmonary venous flows into the left atrium, confirming that there is a complete closure with normalcy of the pulmonary venous return. As you mentioned, in one of the patients where we passed through the PFO catheter, we are documenting the pulmonary venous, venous flows. We had about 24 patients and I will go into just three examples of variant presentations because you had completely covered all the aspects of sinus venosus ASD. The patient number one was a sinus venosus ASD with a second MASD. We, when we did the transesophageal 3D echocardiography, we could identify the second MASD and the sinus venosus ASD. And this is our initial catheter run that is going through the second MASD into the right upper pulmonary vein. And we adopted echo fusion or the echo navigation where we fused the 3D data onto the fluoroscopy. And then we did a double si sizing, like the one balloon is occluding the second MASD and one is occluding the sinus venosus ASD. And we are doing the balloon, the, the pulmonary vein angiography all monitored by the echo navigation. And the device, initially a device was put on the second MASD, 